Richard Viasana. Today's guest is the founder of Forever Homes for Foster Kids and a leading authority on immigration issues and foster families. For three decades, his nonprofit has worked to find family members of foster and immigrant children to give them a permanent home. He'll share insights about his work and his superpower. I'm your host, Devin Thorpe. Welcome to the Superpowers for Good show where we empower you. Richard, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation today. It's really an honor to have you on the show. Thank you very much for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Well, you're doing some amazing work at a pretty remarkable scale uh, with trying to uh, match up foster kids to family and, you know, following in the last, you know, I guess three or four years ago, we went through kind of a peak period of uh, kids coming across the border and being separated from families. And uh, at one point, there were well over a thousand documented cases of kids that had sort of been lost in the system. And and so part of what you do is in, in that space, tell us about the the work you're doing in that regard and then take us beyond that. Okay, well, be happy to do so. So as you said, there are thousands and thousands of children who have recently come across by themselves and have now come into the federal system. But uh, let me back up a little bit though, because in 2017, the Trump administration came up with a plan to mitigate, reduce those numbers, because they were massive numbers coming across the border and asking for asylum. And what they came up with was an idea called zero tolerance. And it was a pilot program. And that's an important distinction because it was not a official policy. So they started this in early 2011 in the El Paso, Texas area. And the idea was this. Anybody who set foot on U.S. soil and asked for asylum, they would immediately have their children separated from them if they came as a family. And this was a huge shift because until then, unless there were really extenuating circumstances, parents and children were never separated. So this happened in 2017, and that's why people probably heard in the last several years about all these facilities popping up, people being moved from Texas all over the United States. Hundreds ended up in New York, for instance. There were over 700 at one time that were dropped on them and needed to be cared for. And this was all part of zero tolerance. So you had these children coming in, and these children were placed by the federal government with sponsors. And I talk about that. The sponsors is just a fancy word for in most cases, a relative, a parent, um, could have been the father who came previously, the mother who came previously, an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, you know, rarely grandparents because of age, but these children were placed then with these sponsors. Okay. And this has been, it went on until June, 2018, when the courts actually, it became, this policy became official. And at that point, the ACLU stepped in, and they were able to go to the courts because now it was an official policy. The courts agreed that this was uh, illegal based on the Fifth Amendment. And at that point, told the administration, you have to stop. So an executive order was put out in June of 2018 saying, we will reunify these children. Now, the numbers have shifted all over the place. But right now, we're looking at more than 5,000 families were impacted by the separation. We had their kids taken away. And some of those children were as young as six months, the ones that I've actually worked with. Wow. And so what, what happened, uh, yeah, about 10, 15% were under the age of five. Uh, those are the cases that just I have worked on. So in 2020, the federal government really started looking to reunite these parents. And they focused on the U.S. They said, maybe we could find these relatives, these sponsors, and make the connections and get these parents reunited with their children. They weren't very successful, though. They went to an excellent organization who did this, but their success rate was about 30%. So they started thinking, well, maybe we need to go to the country of origin, the countries where we ship the parents back to, and see if we can find the parents that way. And 
there was a lot of back and forth talking in 2020. And finally, in 2021, about March, my organization had been contacted by the federal government. They said, look, we have got cases. Um, we need someone who can step in and help us. We need help. And that's where my nonprofit, Forever Homes for Foster Kids, came on the scene at the federal level. And we have been doing this same type of work with counties and foster care agencies for nearly three decades, but now we were doing it for the federal government and to help them. And so just real quickly, and then um, we've been doing that work. And I'm very proud to say that our success rate at finding parents is roughly 93%. Wow. That's great. That's great. Uh, what, what, what happens in the other 7% of the cases? In those cases, uh, we actually had two goals that were set for us. One was to find the relatives if they were living in their country of origin. So a lot of these parents that we've worked with were Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and to see if they were there. Because there's a lot of miscommunication and assumptions. Some people thought the parents might be in the U.S., but they might be back in, for instance, Honduras. Or we thought they were there, but maybe they came to the U.S. There's a lot of movement going on that has complicated this whole reunification. So we were to look at that country, and if we couldn't find them, hopefully we could get some information that would give the people on the U.S. side an idea of where to look in the U.S. Are they in Georgia? Are they in Texas? Are they in Montana? Where are these people now living? And so uh, the... About 83% of the cases we've handled, we found the relatives in their country of origin. For the others, we found out that they are living in the U.S. And so I say 93% because there are some still that, you know, we know they're not in the, where they were, but they could be. But most people aren't aware of this. Every year, 10% of the U.S. population moves. And so just because someone went back to their home country doesn't mean they stayed there. A lot of them didn't, and they're moving around. So there's always going to be that percentage of people you just will never find. And I actually said that when I was interviewed on ABC at the very beginning of this in June of 2018, they said, what do you think the odds are? I said, trust me, there are going to be some people who may have gotten hurt, may have gotten killed, may have died on the way back to their country of origin or since then. And we actually know of a couple of cases where the parent did die um, mm -hmm. and nothing to do with their traveling. But those things happen where these children sure. will never be reunited with that particular parent. Yeah. Heartbreaking cases, heartbreaking cases. Are you able in some of those cases to find other relatives? We have done. That's a great question. We have done that. We have found the uh, grandparents of the children. And we have found brothers and sometimes friends. And sometimes because of the fear, these parents, this is another complication. These parents have a great fear. They've gotten their child to the U.S. Their child was taken away. Yes, they have not seen their child for some of these families for six years. And I say this lightly. It's not that they're okay with that, but they accept that this is what's happened. But there's a little quietness in their soul knowing that their child is in the U.S. That's where they wanted to go in the first place. So even though they're not with that child, and I say, again, lightly, but they're a little at peace with that, knowing that their child is in, for them, what they feel is a better place. So they don't do anything to jeopardize this. And that means a lot of times they don't want to talk to anybody. And we have a case right now just like that. And we're going to try one more time to reach out to the father because a lot of these people, someone in their town will find out about them and they'll try to extort money or tell them, look, you know, we can get you into the U.S. legally, but it's going to cost you a lot of money. And so we're having to fight people who are trying to rip these parents off and we're working to get the right information to them. And even if they're in the federal program to work their way to be brought to the U.S. legally to be reunited with their child, that process isn't always smooth either. No. So we've had to step in and help with translations. We've had to help hold their hand, which is something completely 
off target for what we do, but we do that because it's the right thing to do. And so I have team members in Latin America, especially Central America, who are saying, okay, this is what's happening this week. What do you think we should do? All right, well, we'll try this. We'll contact this agency. We'll find out what they're doing. We'll put the pieces together for them so we can get them up to the U.S. and get them reunited. So there's a lot of work that goes beyond what we were actually contracted to do in finding them. It, it, the problem in those countries you highlighted, Guatemala, uh, El Salvador, and Honduras, uh, it is really pretty astounding. I, I visited Guatemala and, and El Salvador uh, a few years ago to just kind of get a sense of how um, things were there and talk to people, uh, lots and lots of people. And and it was amazing to, to talk to people kind of from all walks of life um you know people living in rural guatemala and urban uh tegucigalpa right either either way they were almost equally likely to tell me they had tried or were thinking about uh trying to get into the united states and i i was stunned at the number who had I was shocked at the number who who knew a coyote that they were talking to. to um, and so it, the, the prevalence just was to me uh, astounding. But it's because not it's not the, the poverty. Poverty is a part of it. I don't want to uh, ignore that reality. But the violence and the corruption that just has so many people living in just a uh, tremendous fear seems to motivate it a lot. Uh, so there's, it's a huge problem. Is there anything in your experience that would contradict what I'm saying from, from my, my visit to those countries? No, actually, I would just add to it. So for instance, one of the things that people have really no understanding of here in this country, for instance, is the education level. So we know that there are a lot of people who have come up from Guatemala, for instance, to the U.S., where the highest level that their children could achieve at school is third grade. And they know this is not going to go anywhere. And these are people who are living, uh, they're doing farming, subsistence farming. And again, that concept is pretty alien to people in this country. When I say subsistence farming, we're talking just above having enough food to live. We're not talking about extra food. We're not talking about food to get new tennis shoes, new pants. We're not talking about anything like that. We're talking poor and people who don't have floors. They have dirt floors. People who are having onion soup, that is their dinner tonight because they have onions that they grow in their garden. We're not talking about meat. We're not talking about chicken. We're not talking about all the things that people think of in this country. is not there, period. Yeah, yeah. So that's number one. And they realize this. I mean, the parents are not maybe uneducated, but they're not stupid. They understand that this is a problem. And I actually worked with someone who did a documentary and showed how children in one area would travel for two to three hours, rocky, dangerous terrain by themselves in the morning on Monday. They would come to a special school that was set up by the government. They would live in town for five days, and on Friday evening, they would walk back to their home. That's what they had to do to get and have an education. So it's not that they're lazy, not that they're stupid. All these words that people in the U.S., unfortunately, as rich as this country is, a lot of people just don't get it. And so that's number one. Number two, you're right about the poverty. Let's talk about the violence so real quickly. A lot of people in this country don't understand either. These countries don't make guns. They don't manufacture guns. That means the violence that's happening down there, for the most part, is being committed with guns, machine guns, semi-automatic weapons that are bought from where? the United States. The United States is one of the, if not the single largest supplier of guns and ammunition to Latin America. So when we hear about this violence, it is homegrown from this country with a government that will not regulate the export of guns, where it is illegal in these countries. They have done everything they can, but they can't stop those people from bringing those guns in 
and causing this violence. And that's the violence that a lot of these people are leaving and trying to get away from. Yeah. And of course, the the, 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 the fundamental crime is primarily uh, the shipment of drugs to the United States, right? So it's, it's uh, again, uh, the U.S. footprint uh, uh, and culpability is really primary. Uh, you know, we're, we're creating the problems that they experience and then, uh, of course, not handling well the fact that they want to come here to avoid the impacts we've created for them. So um, it, it, one of the notes you provided me in advance of the call was the the idea that you think that government needs to be doing more uh, to fund a- accountability uh, around finding uh, the and matching kids to relatives that broadly speaking, there may be tens of thousands of kids in the United States who are uh, matchable to family that are now in foster care. Tell us about that. Okay. And just to keep the topics uh, kind of lined up. So we have the children we've talked about now, the children who came up mm-hmm. with a parent, some recently, uh, who came by themselves, who were pushed, tossed over, you know, passed over uh, by themselves, and who are in the federal system. And there is a federal foster care system run by the ORR, that's the Office of Refugee Resettlement. They are a non judicial, non police organization in the US. They are there simply to take care of the children and to find a sponsor and to get the child to that sponsor. And for the most part, about 75% of those children. Once they're with the sponsor, then the federal government feels it's done its job. And yeah, I would agree that that's a good job. They got them to a relative. They vetted that relative. Now the child's with them. Now that's on the federal side. Once they're with the sponsor, now they're in what I call the civilian side. They're away from the federal government. Now they're with the rest of the population. Let's address what you just asked. So when it comes to foster care, the numbers vary, but it can go anywhere from 400,000 children to 425,000 children who are in the foster care system at any point in a year. And again, it goes up and down. So out of all those children that are in the foster care system, they also have a job. When a child comes into foster care, they've been taken away from their parents for whatever reason. 18% is abuse physical or sexual abuse, and the rest of it is normally neglect. Um, Parents who just have dogs running rampant and filthy, filth all over the place, bad smells, or they just simply leave the kids alone for the weekend. We've read stories about that, where Mm -hmm. the, you know, five-year-old child is taking care of their third-year-old sister, neglect. So they come into the foster care system, the agencies jump into action to try to find a relative that they can match them up to, an aunt, uncle, whatever. Sometimes it's easy to do because the relatives are in town. When that doesn't happen, then they got 30 days to find a relative to take those ch- children in, and that's by federal and state law. So that's great. It's on paper. We've got massive databases here. They can use social media. They can go to these databases they pay $10 to. We've all heard about them, U.S. Search, other different databases to find someone, to call them up and say, hey, we've got one of your relative children here. Would you like to take them in? And a lot of times they will. They have about 80, 85% success rate there. The problem is when you have children whose relatives aren't in the U.S. So we have a lot of children that are, you know, they've got three generations. They came here at Ellis Island, and now they've got three generations. And so they've got a lot of family here. We also have a lot of family who have relatives given, I'm in San Diego, so south of the, you know, along the border. So we're talking south of the border, Mexico, Guatemala, Latin America. Since we're on the West Coast, we could also have children who have relatives in Asia. If you're on the East Coast, Chances are you have relatives in Europe. So maybe we can't find the relatives in the U.S. And maybe we need to look outside to find an absent parent. The force 50%. So you may have a mother, father living in another country, other aunts and uncles. 
The best way for me to describe this, can I tell you a quick story? Please. Great. So there were three girls. There were four, eight, and 10. And they were in foster care. Now, because of their ages, they knew that they had two aunts living in Chicago. But they didn't have phone numbers. They didn't have addresses. They just knew that it was Auntie Martha. That's all they could tell the caseworkers. So the caseworkers tried to find relatives in the U.S. Now, they either found them and they didn't want to take the girls in. Three children is a lot of children. Or they did not find relatives. They came to us because they said, look, we know there are relatives in Mexico. So we'd like you to go look for them. And the reason these agencies come to Forever Homes is because when you have children who are living south of the border, that means their documents are in Spanish. That means the people they have to deal with are speak Spanish. That means they're dealing with foreign governments. This is not typical information that agencies get training on. So they are completely out of their depth when it comes to looking for how to find someone in Brazil, Argentina, Dominican Republic, all places we have done business with and we have dealt with. So they came to us for Mexico. It took us two weeks. We found numbers for an uncle. So the caseworker's on the phone. It's Saturday. She has a translator. She's calling down. She gets the uncle on the phone. And during the conversation, she says, hey, by the way, have you heard of two aunts living in Chicago? And he says, wait a minute. Woman comes on the line. Caseworker introduces herself. Ask the same question. Do you know anything about two ants living in Chicago? She says, of course, I'm one of them. The two ants were having coffee in the living room when the phone call came in. They wow. had flown. Yes. Wow. They had flown down and were visiting that week. And of course, the aunt said, of, of course, we'll take the girls in. As soon as they got back to Chicago, paperwork was done. The girls are now living with the two ants in Chicago. That's what we do. Yeah. That's amazing. That's such a great story. Well, Richard, you're doing such important work uh, and you and really have obviously over the decades built something that is in its space vitally important and hugely successful. Um, what do you see as your superpower? My superpower is really easy. I have the gift of being able to find people. So this was something that was pointed out to me years ago. I got out of the military. I got a medical discharge from the Navy. I was in San Diego. Decided to go back to college and finish it. And I met a man named Antoine Morrison. Now, this person was in who's who of half the countries in Latin America. He did work on behalf of the Department of Defense, Fortune 500 companies, multi-million dollar deals. That's what he would do all throughout Latin America. And I became his protege. And we spent the next eight years together doing business uh, primarily in Mexico. But I did business in every Spanish-speaking country in Latin America, except wow. for Cuba. And um, with him coaching me, training me, throughout multi-million dollar deals to the Mexican government, I ripped for Dozens of U.S. manufacturers, European manufacturers, sold equipment, did it all, and even did it with Venezuela. Very nice people, by the way. I had lovely, lovely people that took care of me when I was uh, dealing with Venezuela. Just want to point that out. And mm -hmm. um, we went to a location in Mexico. I'm trying to make this a short story. So <laughs> we were trying to find... Uh, distributors. And so I'd been bugging him. I said, look, we need to talk to this person named Martha Gurria. And he said, why? I said, I can't tell you. I just know we need to meet this woman when we're in Mexico City. And he said, no, we're not going to do that. We have a goal. We're down there to get distributors. So I said, okay. So we go down to Mexico City. We're Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We're interviewing potential distributors. I'm bugging them every day. We need to meet this woman. And so Thursday, he said, okay, if you'll shut up about it, we'll go, we'll visit. So we're down south of Mexico. This is going to take us half a day. That's why he didn't want to go. So we're down there. Mm -hmm. We're in the building. He's looking at the roster, and he says, okay, let me get this straight. What's the name of that woman? Martha Gurria. Okay, you understand that we're trying to sell equipment to the Mexican government. Yes. And that they buy billions of dollars of new equipment every year. Yes. 
And there's one person who has to sign off on those sales. Okay. Her name is Martha Gurria. <laughs> I had found the <laughs> one person out of, he's like, how did you do that? Out of all 21 million people in Mexico, how did you meet her? And he said, and remind me, you've been talking to her. Yes. You were down here. Yes. You were borrowing her personal books that she was loaning you, having yeah. milk and cookies with her. She was treating you like her grandson. Yes. <laughs> yep. That was it. <laughs> Same reaction, Antoinette. He's just like, oh, my God, I can't believe this. And I found because of him, he pointed out I had this gift. And that's something very important, what I just said. He pointed out to me that I had this gift. I did something similar. We were together. He wanted me to find a person who was with the Department of Commerce. He knew he was in Washington, D.C. And this is pre-Google. He said, try your best to find him. I said, okay. Later that day, I dropped a piece of paper off on his desk. He says, what's this? I said, that's the phone number. He said, this is the phone number. I'm like, yes. He looks at his watch. He says, I asked you five minutes ago. And I'm like, well, I tried to be quick. And he's like, no, you don't get it. I asked you <laughs> only five minutes ago. There was no Google. There was no computer search engine. He said, okay, you've got to tell me what you did. Yeah. I said, well, I called Maria up at the Economic Development Center. We talked for a moment. She passed me to John in Washington. I talked to John. John got me to Suzanne, and Suzanne gave me the number. <laughs> for me, it's like, okay, job done. I'm out of here. And yeah. he's like, I've never seen anyone do that. I said, I do it all the time. And he said, you're not listening to me. And I knew him well enough, so I stopped, kind of calmed down, stood you know, in front of his desk. I'm like, okay, what are you trying to tell me? He said, look, you know who I am? You know all the places I've been, all the people I've worked with. When I tell you I have never met someone who is able to do what you just did, that means something. I said, I do it all the time. He said, but that does not make it worthless. And that's so important because a lot of people have a superpower. People tell them about it, but they blow it off because they're thinking, but it's so easy for me. That's yeah. the catch. It is easy for us with our superpower. We don't have to think about it. We don't have to spend years working on it. We can improve it, but we have that superpower. I'm able to look at documents and see the information I need. And people can read the same document and they don't see anything. Mm -hmm. And I can see phone numbers where other people don't see anything. And it's not that it's not printed. They don't see. Sherlock Holmes, when he's asked by Watson, and actually a lot of people have, have called me the Sherlock Holmes of foster care. Yeah. And the, what Sherlock Holmes said to Watson, Watson said, how do you do this? He said, Watson. You see, but you don't observe. You hear, but you don't listen. So that's the difference between us. I observe, I listen. And that's what I am able to do with my superpower is I'm able to see, hear information, and zero in on what is appropriate, even if it doesn't match. I have found people, and the names don't match, but I said, this is the right person. Okay, they'll call, they'll come back. Oh my God, it was. I'm like, of course it was. How did you know? I just knew that was the right person. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. I can't explain. I just know. Yeah. Well, listen, Richard, uh, you point out that th there's a lot of sort of natural ability, a gift here, but you also noted that it could be improved. And to some extent, that means that anyone could learn to do it better even if they're not gifted at it. And those who are gifted could learn to be more like you. Tell us, how would you go about honing this skill as, as a talent? How would you develop this if you were, or how would you coach someone to develop this? So when it comes to my gift, it definitely has been an evolution. Like you always get better by looking at your process. How am I doing? If you're baking, for instance, how could you bake better? Could you have better equipment? Could you have better ingredients? Is there a way of mixing those ingredients in a particular way? You're always going to take that gift, that natural inclination, and make it better by looking at people who are doing 
the best. Now, in my case, there really hasn't been anyone for me to model myself after, except, and it is my childhood love uh, hero, and that is Sherlock Holmes, looking at, and I have been modeling myself after him because for me, I am doing research. I am doing investigations. I have a team. There are certainly people who help me. So that was number one. I have a team. Number two, I look at my process. So when I first started out with some of these countries, I only had two different agencies I could go to, but I knew there were more. And so part of my work has been to go deeper and deeper and find as many agencies as I want to, because what succeeded with case number one won't work with case number four. And what worked with both those cases may not work for any case that's case number eight, because there's something missing. And I actually had a case like that. Real quickly, we had the name of the mother. We had one of the pieces of information. They told me she lived in El Salvador. That was it. And I still wow. closed the case. Still oh, that's it. great. So back again to what we can do to improve. So it's reading information about what we're doing. It's the things that help add on to what we're doing. So, yeah, it's wonderful we can find people, but it doesn't help if we're not organized. It doesn't help if we don't have you know, admins and we don't have a functioning support team behind us. And if we don't know how to teach those people what we do, and we can't put down into a process because just because I'm gifted doesn't mean I can't document how I do things. So someone else could come behind me and maybe they won't do it as well as I do, but they'll do it at a far superior level than they would without me. And that's the thing I'm working on right now with, as you asked earlier, the foster care system. We have people, caseworkers who are supposed to be looking for relatives and they don't know how. They're not getting the training. And so one of my goals is to take what I'm doing and teach them, go to the universities who do not teach what I do, and go to the different agencies and teach what I do. So I will be doing that. And in doing that, I will learn even more because they'll ask me things I've never thought about. Right. So teaching yeah. is a great ability, way to improve it. So we've got doing it. We've got putting it in the process. We got developing a team and whatever other infrastructure we need that will allow us to keep working and refining what we're doing. I will never be there. And that's one other thing I want to say. When we have a gift, we have to be setting our own bar. We don't care about anyone else's bar. Simone Biles said that. She wasn't rating herself on some other gymnast. She said, I'm only competing with myself. That's the attitude that will carry someone who has a gift past all the negativity, past all the family members who don't believe in them, the friends who say, oh, you're just, you're out there, you're egotistical. No, it's not ego. It's realizing we have a gift and we need to do something with it because it will drive us and we can tap into that. And, but we have to set our own bar. We cannot let the rest of the world set the bar because they're going to set it too low. Yeah. Great point. Great point. Well, uh, Richard, thank you so much for being with us today. Before we, we wrap up, could you take just a minute, tell people how they can learn more about you and uh, the incredible work you're doing with Forever Families? So they can go to our website, Forever Homes for F-O-R, fosterkids.org. Also, I would recommend anyone who's interested in immigration, the children, foster care, to get my new book. Do no harm. It's on Amazon. This will give you information that really is not out there. People can talk about their foster kids and foster personal stories. This is about the industry, our failings, and how we can improve it. And so I would recommend to people that they, they do that and get the book. If It's right here. Do no harm. And uh, it will talk about everything we've talked about here and give them some really good detailed information. And those are two ways, proceeds from the book Excellent. do go to help the foster kids. So, Oh, fantastic. Well, Richard, thank you so much. We, we uh, thank you for being here and we wish you every success in helping uh, foster kids find their uh, forever families. Well, you are so welcome. I appreciate the opportunity. All righty. Let's do some good. Thank you for tuning in to the Superpowers for Good show twice each week. 
we host changemakers who share their impact, insights, and superpowers. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today at superpowersforgood.com. That's superpowers, number four, good.com. Be super empowered. Get your copy of the book, Superpowers for Good, as an ebook, audiobook, paperback, or hardcover edition via your favorite online retailer. Interested in having me speak to your company, organization, or association? Visit devonthorpe.com. Then let's talk. Now, keep using your superpowers for good. Together, we can reverse climate change, improve global health, and eradicate poverty.